and I got my MFA in painting. That was where I was thinking I was going to head. I was going to show in the best galleries in the world. And, you know, it's, it's a tough life to live if you uh, don't have a trust fund. At the end of the day, reality uh, comes fast and I had to get a job. What's been consistent throughout my life is that I've been a dreamer and I'm a visionary. I'm very much, that's my sweet spot, if you will, when it comes to the position I'm in now. If I could spend my time thinking about ideas and dreaming about where we could go, um, that's where I can add the most value to my business and the world, I would argue. I thought, wouldn't it be nice to see Latino stories told in, in a way that were designed better, written better, and, and better quality paper, right? Um, because there wasn't anything out there that I saw that told that story. One of my first concerns was that we were going to run out of Latinos to highlight. Um, and, you know, we never did, and we still have it. When Pedro Guerrero entered corporate America, there was one national magazine covering Latinos in business, Hispanic business. Yet at the time, one in 10 people in the U.S. was Hispanic, and that number was growing rapidly. Pedro Guerrero, once a frustrated art school graduate, wanted to make sure there was more than just one magazine representing the community. He wanted to create a magazine that would highlight the stories of Latinos in powerful positions across some of the United States' biggest companies. Today, the publication is far more than a magazine. It boasts interviews with some of the country's biggest changemakers, from Jessica Alba to former Housing and Urban Development Secretary under President Barack Obama, Julian Castro. Today, Pedro Guerrero is the CEO and founder of Guerrero, the company that publishes Hispanic Executive, Profile Magazine, and other publications. He joins Business School to tell us how he went from art student to media executive, the connection he has to famed architect Frank Lloyd Wright, and how launching in a recession wasn't as bad as it sounds, and how he managed to get an interview with Vice President Kamala Harris aboard Air Force Two. Plus, he answers questions from small business owners around the country. I'm journalist Fernando Hurtado, and on Business School, I'm on a mission to map one of the fastest growing groups of entrepreneurs in the United States, Latinos. We're tracking how they got started, found success, and the most important lessons they've learned along the way. And remember, business school is expensive. Business school is free. All right, Pedro, welcome to business school. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Thanks for uh, joining. I'm excited to talk to you because you went to prep school on the East Coast and the reason I'm excited about that is because I myself went to prep school, but on the West Coast, so we have that in common. But I'm curious, how does a, a boy who grew up in Northern California, Hayward to be exact, end up in Rhode Island for high school? Uh, yeah, uh, great question. I, I get that question all the time when people ask me how I ended up in Chicago. I have to start a few steps back. Um, but as you mentioned, I grew up in Hayward, California. My parents were both teachers in the area. Um, and I, I think my mom, at the end of the day, was a little bit um, concerned about the high school that I was going to be going to. And she really wanted to find a, a better path for me from an academic standpoint. She had heard of a program called a, a Better Chance, ABC, uh, I, I think on the radio or maybe on the Oprah show or something like that. Uh, and she had me apply. And so I had to go take a test and and. Uh, Put an application together and it's essentially almost like a uniform application they sent my um my my material to schools across the country uh and i remember getting a few acceptance letters from a couple of schools st george's being one of them that's where i went and i remember groton academy being the other and um and i i talked to the admissions counselor there and the biggest hang up i had at the time was the fact that the school was Episcopal and I was a very pious Catholic altar boy at the time. That was really my biggest hangup, but that's how I got to St. George's. I was a 12 year old kid. My, my parents left the decision up to me and I started thinking about what it'd be like to go to this school across the country. And in a leap of faith, I accepted and my dad and I flew out there and, and he dropped me off. And, and uh, it was a absolutely transformative experience for me at that young age. Yeah, I, I can relate to that so much. I mean, I, I wasn't part of a better chance, but I was part of the the Chicago version of a of a better chance. And I remember my boarding school experience was very, as you say, transformative. How did your experience change you? Uh, it changed me fundamentally. It opened my horizons of what's possible. Uh, it uh, uprooted me in many ways from uh, my home and my family, which was tough. Um, but at the same time, it untethered me. It, it allowed me to 
I think trailblazing independence that I don't know I would have been able to trailblaze uh, if I had stayed around in California. I mean, I was literally by myself across the country. And that independence has helped me and has informed me, frankly, in my entrepreneurial journey. I think it, it, it was the, 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 the prologue to it in, in many ways. Um, the other way that the school transformed me was really twofold, putting me in, into rooms where I was literally one of two Latinos in the entire school. Uh, so I was surrounded by people that didn't look like me, uh, people that came from a different socioeconomic uh, uh, class, if you will. Uh, so um, that it forced me to become comfortable with the uncomfortable of that type of environment. And that's very much... Uh, something that I experience now as a business owner um, and with the executives that I talk to in the Fortune 1000 and, and being able to talk to people um, that come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different pedigrees, etc. Um, that's really at the end of the day how the school fundamentally pre prepared me for the, the lot in life that I currently uh, uh, I'm in. So after going to high school at St. George's in Rhode Island, you then go to Bowdoin College in Maine, where you kind of start discovering uh, and maybe even rediscovering this passion you've always had for for painting. And you're not the only Pedro in your family to have an affinity for art. What I thought was fascinating is that another Pedro in your family has a very personal connection to the renowned architect Frank Lloyd Wright, correct? That's right. So I'm, I'm technically the fourth Pedro uh, Guerrero. Uh, my grandfather, uh, Pedro Eduardo Guerrero, the original Pedro Guerrero, uh, he was a photographer. Uh, and he, at a young age, went to the Pasadena Art Academy, uh, following in the footsteps of his older brother, who was a painter. Um, he told the story better than I can, but he was uh, kicked out of school there. Uh, and when he was home, uh, working for his father, who was a sign painter, he actually listened to his his father, my tata's advice, uh, to go and talk to this architect who needed, uh, who may you know have a need for a photographer. Uh, and so my grandfather listened to him, went over there, and introduced himself to Frank Lloyd Wright as a photographer, and uh, that transformed his life. Uh, he took him under his wing. My grandfather was the first and probably only Latino Taliesin fellow. Uh, he became close friends with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, he was his personal photographer. Some of the most um, iconic images of the architect were taken by my grandfather and, of course, of his buildings. Um, so I always I, I grew up with an awareness of art and uh, and photography, certainly uh, his wife. My grandmother was a painter. So the, art uh, was around my upbringing. My parents were. Um, fans of Chicano art. So I saw a lot of that kind of iconography growing up at home. Um, in high school, I started taking photography lessons, I think because of my grandfather. And it was at Bowdoin where I took drawing. Um, you know, I was always a creative kid uh, growing up. That's something that my mom would always say, you're so creative, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and I love to draw. And so I decided to explore that at Bowdoin and I fell in love with it. And much to my mom's uh, despair, you know, I, I told her I wanted to be uh, a studio art major and also art history, you know, that important double major that really kind of gets you into the jobs that you need. Um, and so that's what I ended up uh, falling in love with at, at Bowdoin. And that's that ultimately became um, my major. I had aspirations to be a painter. Um, and that's what took me to Chicago. So I had applied to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago uh, for a painting degree, and I got my MFA in painting, uh, and and that's right out of grad school. That was where I was thinking I was going to head. I was going to show in the best galleries in the world, and you know, it's it's a tough life to live if you uh, don't have a trust fund, or if you're, uh, you know, uh, if you're not the best artist the world's ever seen. Um, and so, really, at the end of the day, reality. Uh, comes fast and I had to get a job and that's really what led me into the career that I am now So what was your first first job right after grad school? So my first first job right after grad school was uh, a fascinating one. I was an art mover um, uh, Which is exactly what you pictured your graduate degree in, in painting would get you. That's exactly right I mean, I think that the the fancier word is art preparator or whatever. I was an art mover but what was cool about it was that I was able to see incredible work firsthand, handle it, hang it, 
go to some of the wealthiest homes here in Chicago and see these incredible collections. So uh, it was a fun job for a while, but at the end of the at the end of the day, I was a fancy you know mover. Um, nothing wrong with that uh, line of work, but it's not what I was interested in doing. Um, and then you know, really at the end of the day, I needed to to make more money. I mean, that's a reality of life. Uh, and so a friend of mine from art school got me a job at a publishing company and that's where I, uh, in ad sales. And that's where it was, that's where I really got my, my first foray into sales and lo and behold, it turns out I was pretty good at it. Uh, and so that's really, uh, what was the, the space and the mindset that, that launched uh, Guerrero media. So with that ad sales job, like what was your day to day? Were you on the phone trying to you know, that's sell right. Ads for for magazines, for newspapers. Yeah, I was I was on the phone, cold calling and calling people to sell advertising in these niche magazines that we published at this company that I worked for. Uh, it was it was old school. It was I had leads on paper, a phone. I was expected to do 120 calls a day. Um, I don't even think I had email. You know, it was one of those times. So a lot of uh, uh, preparation for the type of you know sales management tips that people I'm sure today don't want to hear from me. But it was you know I think it was a type of um, uh, it was it's a tough job. It's not easy, but it 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 conditions you to to certainly get prepared for rejection. It conditions you to really think about how to perform on every single call. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it wasn't easy. It was probably as hard to learn how to get comfortable on a cold call as it was to leave my home at the age of 12 and go to a boarding school across the country. It was that difficult psychologically. But what I was able to tap into at the end of the day, once it clicked, was a lot of the training that I had received in art school. Um, uh, you know, uh, this concept of having to perform, having to think creatively. I mean, you really have to uh, uh, embody uh, 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 this performative state uh, when you're on the phone and, and you have to do it well. Uh, and so a lot of that uh, sort of uh, unintentionally, a lot of that creative training really started to help in getting me to understand how to perform well on a sale uh, and then that act, that actual job, uh, which is brutal and the, you know, you don't, you, I, I, you know, the, the, the success rate of cold calling, I mean, I, God knows, right. It, you, you get rejected 90% of the time, but that also conditions you and prepares you for the life of an entrepreneur. You have to pick up the phone. You have to make the call. Nothing is guaranteed. And that's exactly the same when you're trying to run your own business, right? So it, it gives you that grit uh, that you need to, to run your own firm. And what I think is interesting about your story is that you go into this ad sales job because you're looking for something a little more steady than, you know, your, 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 the painting industry and the artist industry. You get that sta stable job and then you say... I, I kind of want something a little a little more risky. Let me go start my own company. Why did you want to start your own company? Well, because it sounded interesting. It sounded cool. Um, it it uh, was creative. Uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, what's been consistent throughout my life is that I've been a dreamer and I'm a visionary. I'm very much, that's my sweet spot, if you will, when it comes to the position I'm in now. If I could spend my time thinking about ideas and dreaming about where we could go, um, that's where I can add the most value to my business and the world, I would argue. And so, you know, being able to have these dreams and conversations, and that's how my business started. It was a conversation with a colleague who I sat next to about, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we had started our own firm, our own magazine? Um, and so I'm an idea guy. I'm a visionary guy. I'm also someone that doesn't back down. So, you know, if we're talking a big game and that's where the conversation's headed. Um, that's where it's going to go. Um, and then I took that leap of faith. You know, a big part of this is also the ignorance that comes with uh, the leap. I, I didn't know what it, I was going to have to, ha you know, tackle when I'm starting my business. I didn't know what kind of prep school or what it was going to be like to be this young Latino in an East Coast prep school. I didn't know, right? And so you got to have an element of ignorance in many ways um, to be successful when you're making that leap. And that's certainly what I had going into it. Uh, and a lot of the lessons I've learned along the way have been uh, through, you know, failure and uh, uh, figuring it out 
on my own. So your idea is to start a trade publication for the construction industry. That was the first where does, one. Where does that come from? That's literally the, I, I, it was a competitive brand to what I was doing at the time. So I knew the space and, and so did my partner. And that's where we began. Uh, we still publish the, the brand today. Uh, but shortly thereafter, I had the idea around uh, starting Hispanic executive. And the concept was not dissimilar than the, than starting the business, you know, is really like, wouldn't it be, not, wouldn't it be cool? to have a publication that highlighted Latinos in a top shelf way. I mean, that's how I was thinking about it. Um, uh, when I was home growing up in Hayward, my dad subscribed to Hispanic Business. It's a magazine that no longer exists, but I remember seeing it and it was, uh, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was an, important, an important publication, but I felt that it was kind of a throwaway mag. It, it didn't have good paper. It was, you know, kind of cheaply made in my opinion. And maybe this is my creative uh, training or my aesthetic sensibilities. I thought, wouldn't it be nice to see Latino stories told in, in a way that were designed better, written better and, and better quality paper, right? Um, because there wasn't anything out there that I saw that told that story. And there's still a lack of platforms now uh, telling any types of positive Latino narratives, right? So that was really the initial idea um, and, uh, you know, it, we decided to launch it. I remember one of the first concerns I had and mind you, Facebook was also starting at the time. So there wasn't a lot of, um, access as we have now to people out in the marketplace. I, one of my first concerns was that we were going to run out of Latinos to highlight. Um, and you know, we never did and we still have it. And I think it, it, it speaks to, uh, uh, just the growing presence that we have in the business landscape, certainly in the demographic space, um, and and how much more you know how much there is a need for podcasts like this one, uh, for the work that you know, people are doing to elevate the, the 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 stories of Latino success out there in the marketplace. Yeah, and when you launched this, it was uh, two thousand seven, two thousand six. I started my company in two thousand six. And, and we launched executive. Panic Executive, I want to say, within two years of doing that. Okay. So around that time, um, well, actually now in 2021, I found a survey that 4% of the companies most of, of U.S. companies' most senior executives in the U.S. were Latino in 2021, right? Yeah. So I imagine back then it was even fewer. Yep. What was the reaction from, from industry people or publishing execs when you said, hey, I want to launch a, a, a publication that focuses on, on, on Latinos uh, powerful Latinos in business. Uh, I can tell you the reaction from the people we talked to, uh, and the people we talked to, the Latinos that we wanted to profile, they were uh, eager and excited to be highlighted. Um, what was the reaction from the industry? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I didn't. I didn't really care. <laughs> and I think if I had been in tune with that, um, I might have perhaps thought differently about starting it at the time. And that isn't, you know, that's something that I've encountered often. I'm sure entrepreneurs and other people that listen to this show also encounter. You know, we started a professional community in 2014 for Latinos that went to uh, some of the top schools in the country. And I remember someone telling me, uh, good luck with this. It's too niche. And this was another Latino. Um, and, you know, when we developed it, uh, members of this group were telling me I was looking for something like this, right? So I think within the Latino category, more broadly, there's opportunity for a lot of niche brands and products because there's people out there saying, you know, this is something that I was looking for. Um, I, I think about going to the grocery store, right? I recently spoke to um, Miguel Garza of, of uh, Siete Foods and, you know, his product is something that when I saw it, I said, I've been wanting something like this for so long. And I guarantee you, there is something like that for Latinos across the board. We're just being underserved, right? So I look at this as an opportunity for anybody thinking about any product or business that is going to cater to the Latino in an authentic way. It's a big blue ocean of opportunity, in my opinion. And Miguel Garza, he's with Siete Foods. They make gluten-free Mexican products, chips, snacks um, across the board. And I think they were probably one of the first major, major yeah. gluten-free products in, in that category. And with 
Hispanic executive, you know, there's no shortage of content for you to tell stories back when you first launched, right? But the other side of this is it still has to make money somehow. So what was the, the, the first year like? Did you guys make money right away? No, not that brand. <laughs> so that brand was very much supported by the activity of the other brands. And it wasn't until I would say uh, as we started to invest more into that brand by way of events, by way of uh, diversifying the content we're producing, where we started to see that brand on its own be much more profitable. So we benefited from having a portfolio of brands that can help each other. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was it, it took a while. But I think now it's my lead horse, if you will. It's 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 paying off. And who was writing articles at at that time when you first launched? We had a couple of editors in house, and we have a lot of uh, freelance writers. Okay, so the other thing, when you launch, uh, you very conveniently launch in the middle of a recession. Yeah. So what was what was uh, braving those winds like? Yeah, we launched a construction bag right uh, uh, right before the two thousand eight crisis. I think we benefited from our size at the time. Uh, it, it was certainly harder uh, for us in many ways, but uh, we were able to 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 skate by. Um, but we've had a lot of recessions and, and great economies that we've gone through. I mean, we've been around for 18 years. Uh, and I think the greatest challenge uh, that we've uh, had to endure is the one that all of us had to endure recently, COVID. So, you know, if anything, that those early uh, headwinds back in 2008 uh, prepared us and prepared me certainly to be able to tackle even greater headwinds later on down the road. So I want to hear about how you you tackle the pandemic and later how you're able to get an interview with Vice President Kamala Harris. Before yeah. I ask you that, though, yeah. I have questions from other people, and those people are Comcast Rise Award recipients. So Comcast Rise has awarded more than $125 million in monetary, marketing, and technology grants to businesses all over the United States. So we asked two of them to send their questions for you, and I'm okay. going to play them for you and then you can give us uh, your answer. So let me just pull those up. Hi, this is Rachel and Hazel from DRIO from Baltimore, Maryland. What key strategies would you recommend for owners to effectively manage their money? You know, it, 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 it's tough. And I have, uh, uh, you, you know, I, I, my, like yours, I'm sure, is a, is a unique situation. Um, you know, I think one of the most important things that I've come to understand over 18 years, and it came from my mentor. I've, I've been meeting with my mentor monthly for the past 14 years. And every month, the first question he asked me is, how's cash doing? And I used to get so annoyed by being asked that question over and over. And it's like, I wanted to talk strategy. I wanted to, but he's like, how's cash? And it, it's become a mantra and a way of managing the finances of the organization. It's incredibly important to be uh, certainly cash flow positive, but to be managing your cash on a weekly basis. And, and so, you know, how does an entrepreneur manage uh, the money? One, uh, I, got, I was able to get to a place where I was able to hire somebody to manage my money because I would say I'm not the, the, the best at it. Uh, early on, it was managed by my partner. So one of the, uh, you know, the advice I would give if, 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 if advice is being sought is that, you know, depending on if you have a partnership, making sure that one of you is stronger at the finances and whoever is stronger at the finances, that they're the ones that are running it. Um, but so that's how we managed it early on, making sure that we divided responsibilities, gave ourselves clear lanes uh, so that, you know, we could play to our unique strengths. Like I mentioned earlier, I was able to hire somebody to run our finances, which is critical. Uh, but then making sure that we're paying attention to them on a weekly basis, specifically cash, is, is something that I find invaluable. Uh, and on the personal side, it's not dissimilar. Um, you know, there's no, I think it was Calvin Coolidge that said, there's no greater freedom than living within your means. Um, and so I think making sure that you are uh, living within your means, and, and certainly the business is probably the best path to sanity. And our last question is from the founder of a beauty company. Let's hear what she has to ask. Hello, my name is Erica Bigger and I am the founder and CEO of Holy Gloss. If you're assessing your market and the market that you're currently serving, what type of insights, what type of data, and what type of trends should you be looking for in your market and why? 
And also, once you have that information, what should you do with it? And how should you actually apply it to your business to make it better? That's a great question. Um, well, you're in the beauty industry. Um, and so for me, um, I think I would be thinking about, you know, the demographic shift that's happening in the country. Uh, that is uh, going to have trans transformative impact on every business, uh, certainly a B2C business, but also B2B. Uh, the, com the country's uh, becoming much more multicultural, obviously as a Latino, a big portion of that is Latino. And so uh, are you uh, thinking about that marketplace for the product that you are developing? Um, because I think if you're not, um, then you're already starting behind. Um, so uh, that's the first thing I would say is like, who are you trying to target? Um, and then uh, making sure that you are prepared to speak to that consumer um, uh, as you start to, to roll out. Your question is about data and how do you get that data? Um, you know, it, it obviously this varies uh, with, with, with businesses, but um, I would probably uh, uh, bring a cohort together of people that you're trying to target. Right? So if you're in the beauty industry, again, are you making a product for people like you? Are you making a product for people like your business, uh, like, so, like your friends? Uh, if so, can you bring them together? Can you use them as a focus group to um, talk about the value prop of the, the beauty line, the product itself, uh, so you can get that information to, to help you know, either validate uh, your hypotheses or uh, tweak whatever you're putting out there in the world so that it lands appropriately? That's what I would say. Great. Thank you, Pedro. And thanks to our Comcast Rise businesses for sending in those questions. I want to get back to your story. So you launched Hispanic Executive and you say it wasn't making money right away. What was the business model? Was it ad sales and that's how you, you thought you were going to make money? Yeah, for the for the longest time, the 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 the, the model was ad sales, correct? Uh, sponsored content, ad sales. That was really uh, the bread and butter for the brand. Okay, so you you at the launch, and maybe it's to be expected of a new brand. You're not expecting it to you know take off immediately. When do you start seeing financial momentum with Hispanic Executive? You know, I would say probably about five years in. Um, looking at that brand view uh, alone, uh, that's when it was uh, adding to the bottom line. Um, but we started to really see more of a transformative impact on that brand when we started to branch out beyond just uh, uh, publishing uh, profiles of executives. I think once we started to uh, expand into events, um, uh, hosting dinners or uh, other types of experiences where we were able able to bring together some of the Latinos that we were fortunate to connect with. Um, that's when we started to really uh, move into the space of corporate sponsorships, um, bigger uh, uh, advertising packages, et cetera. So I think uh, this is not uncommon for publishers to start really expanding into events and other types of, uh, of you know, associated revenue lines. Uh, uh, but that's really when Hispanic executives started to have more of a you know financial success is once we were out in the market having events uh, and really uh, being I would say a little bit more creative on what we're able to drive to the world as far as value. So in those first five years, you know, I'm sure it was a little unnerving to see that it wasn't you know generating maybe as much as you'd hoped. Did you ever think hmm, maybe you know we should shut this down, or were you always set on continuing it and pushing forth? Uh, I don't know if it's because I'm stubborn or I, I believe in more we're headed. Uh, there were many instances to consider shutting down the business, um, but I didn't. Um, I, I believed in what we were doing. I believed in what we were building. And um, so far, knock on wood, um, it's, it's been proven right. So, yeah, that's always there's at every stage of growth, I would say, or macroeconomic headwinds um, that question um, certainly comes to the forefront. Um, and, and maybe that's why my business advice uh, uh, goes back to managing cash. I think at the end of the day, um, that's why it's so critical to be keeping track and watching sort of the, uh, the, the, the cash outflows and inflows of the organization and making sure that you're uh, trying to drive towards profitability and everything you, that you do. But 
but yeah, that question came up many times. And you've, you know, Hispanic executive has interviewed dozens of, of executives and, and leaders in the community. What's been your favorite or your most proud interview that you've done? Uh, and don't say Kamala just yet, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. Um, who, who else are some of your favorites? I've had so many that I've, I've really enjoyed. And, and I think, um, as you know, I, I, I've started a podcast recently, and that's really put uh, more of a focus on this uh, act of interviewing. And uh, some of the, the people that I've really enjoyed interviewing, it was the first one I had on my show, a gentleman by the name of Bobby Herrera. I was at an airport or air probably, and I saw you know, one of these books uh, on leadership, and I, I buy too many of them. Uh, but his book was called The Gift of Struggle. And I remember looking at it, and my first thought was like, oh, Bobby Herrera, Latino. And, uh, and it was a good book, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, but in the middle of the book, he talks about this really um, important uh, piece of family, uh, this, this heirloom. It was, a, it was an ID from his grandfather as a bracero that he would keep on his wall to remind him of the sacrifice and the grit that it took to get him where he's at today. And that resonated with me because my grandfather was also a bracero. And my grandfather also uh, worked incredibly hard to give me the life that I have lived. And um, the fact that I picked up this leadership book that resonated with me, that was written by a Latino, that also had this sort of connection that I had to my grandfather, uh, being able to interview him live as my first guest, you know, I was like, it was like I was a fanboy. It's like I was so excited to talk to him and so inspired to come away from it. So I would say that's the one that resonates the most, but I've had... I've had so many uh, recently. I talked to the great uh, investor Orlando Bravo and uh, on our podcast and uh, just uh, incredible to be able to speak to somebody that has that level of business intelligence is um, I'm, I'm floored, right? So uh, that's the one thing I, uh, not the one thing, that's one of a few things that I truly love about the work that I do is that I get to speak to these incredible people um, much like you're doing now, not to say that I'm on, on the same level as them, but you know, uh, I think the premise of your podcast is about getting lessons from these people that you're talking to. Well, I get tons of lessons, uh, from the people that I talk to every single day and it's, it's been invaluable. Yeah. I mean, the reason we started this is, is to have a free business school. So there you go. And I've had school. my free one too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, certainly a good, a good, uh, product byproduct to come from uh, interviews. So you know, it takes around five years for a Hispanic executive to kind of see some financial momentum. How does the team look at this point? Like, you, you know, you rely on a lot of freelancers to, to write these pieces, to do these interviews. Uh, how do you how do you get the sausage made, basically? With Hispanic executive, uh, as we started to venture into new areas of, of, of work, like events, um, um, you know, we had to hire people that were focused specifically on that line of business. Um, so slowly over time, that brand became, I would say, a little bit more formalized in the team that's working on it uh, full time, if you will. So by that point, though, you know, we, we had a lot of staff in house. Right. So um, because Hispanic executive is one of a, 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 a portfolio of brands. So by that point, you know, we had a controller managing the finances. We had a creative team, a couple of in-house designers, in-house editors. Um, one of my partners at the time was essentially the creative director. Another partner I mentioned earlier was essentially the head of finance. Uh, and so our, the structure of the organization started to get built out a little bit more um, uh, in a formalized way. Um, most of our teams worked across brands. But what was unique about Hispanic Executive was that, one, it was our only brand focused on a specific demographic. So there needed to be a little bit more specificity from a cultural standpoint on the work to drive that brand forth. So, um, so that's how the, the, the team started to coalesce around Hispanic Executive. Today, you know, we have uh, four different Latino-focused brands. And so uh, the team that works on on those brands is essentially one unit. Um, so they're working across a variety of different Latino brands that we own. Um, but it's, it's sort of the internally we call our Hispanic division because we have a team that is really dedicated uh, to the work that we're doing specifically within Latino cohort. So 
we talked about the first headwind, first big headwind, which is the recession, the 08 recession. And then the pandemic comes, which, you know, affected businesses across all sectors. How were you impacted by the closures, the, the consumer behavior that we saw change pretty much overnight for a long time? We were impacted in, in different ways. Um, on, on the positive side, all of our audience went digital. And so um, we saw uh, an incredible increase in digital engagement with everyone that we spoke to. Um, it, it forced us to make moves digitally that we had been postponing uh, for the longest time. So it actually really fast-tracked our digital evolution, if you will. And from that standpoint, it was helpful for the business having to uh, be in this virtual space. Our, obviously, events function uh, couldn't be in person, so we moved them over to virtual. We had partners that really loved our work and supported us, and luckily they stayed with us without you know, saying, hey, give me my money back. I mean, they, they, they too were in the same space. And, and so from that perspective, it was, um, uh, you know, we navigated that uh, uh, impressively, frankly. My team quickly pivoted uh, to driving our value uh, virtually. Um, we had some opportunities that came our way because of where we were. Uh, our landlord let us out of our lease. Essentially, we had to negotiate. And so that, you know, we were saddled with a lease that we had to sort of pay for, which was advantageous for us. Um, but pre-COVID, I was very much old school in that I didn't really believe in remote work. And, mm. and so the, the shift uh, of, of taking that leap, right, that we're going to have to figure this out remotely, um, mm. I think was helpful for me as a leader to really think about what's possible. And, and I would say question some of my legacy assumptions going in uh, to, you know, into COVID that, um, you know, that, that I think still inform us today. I mean, we were able to become agile and move quickly, which is something that I didn't think we could do uh, going into it. Right. If you had asked us, shut the, you know, close the shop, move everyone remote, uh, figure out how to do your work digitally, figure out how to wrap and print and produce a magazine digitally, um, I would have said no chance, uh, but we had to. And so um, as an outcome, it really, I think in many ways, empowered me and empowered our leadership team to really think about what other types of evolution we have ahead that we can expedite and not sit on. Um, you know, one thing I would tell my team throughout COVID was if, if we're not going to do this now, when will we do it? I mean, this is the opportunity um, really to, to make changes to things that we've been doing for, you know, the, the first 15 years of existence that we've been wanting to change for so long. Well, COVID provided the opportunity to do so um, for better or for worse. And, and so that's how really it, it transformed our business. But the other thing, too, is that we had a pretty good uh, financial uh, structure in place um, and, and a great relationship with our bank at the time. We were in a regional bank. Uh, and so when it came to like the PPP, for example, we were on top of our uh, financial material, on top of our relationship uh, right away. And uh, that ultimately saved us. Uh, and, you know, because I, if we hadn't, if we had delayed, if, if God forbid we were in a, in, a, in, a, in a bank that didn't have the fastest response time or customer care that our, you know, it would have been a lot tougher. And so, um, Inadvertently, we were prepared for it. And then the event itself prepared us, I think, to, to really uh, uh, grow beyond where we've been since 2020. You, you weather the pandemic storm of 2020. And then in 2022, you get an interview with Vice President Kamala Harris. How does something like that come about? And how does it come about aboard Air Force Two? Yeah, that was an incredible experience. It's certainly once in a lifetime. I think ultimately one of the things that I have benefited from uh, throughout the 70 years of business is talking to these incredible people. Uh, along the way, we have highlighted uh, uh, so many uh, amazing people in, in the private sector, also in policy, et cetera. Uh, so we had highlighted someone that knew uh, the vice president and the vice president is, is making a concerted effort to connect with Latinos, uh, specifically Latinos in the private sector. and. And so that's how we were approached about, you know, is there an opportunity to, to, to highlight the president in some way? And of course, like we would love to. Um, and, 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 and then through conversations with the office, 
they asked us if we would be open to having uh, an interview on Air Force Two. And it's like, of, of course, of course, we'd like to. Uh, and so that that's how we ended up there, um, which was incredible. You know, uh, we were with the press corps. Uh, you know, we are in media, but I would call ourselves the press corps, you know, so uh, the press corps is asking these deep, deep, serious questions. And I'm up there with, uh, you know, the, the president, but it was it was it was wonderful. Uh, I was able to connect with the vice president in a way that it, uh, I found uh, valuable. I ended up interviewing her on the podcast. And so that connection uh, carried over, I think, I hope in, in the interview we had. But being in the presence of of her and her leadership and, and then also the apparatus that is involved in, in getting her from point A from B to me was just incredibly fascinating. And what, 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 like, what was she like and, and her demeanor? Was it, you know, what, what you thought it'd be like the, the whole experience? I thought she was, I, I thought she was incredible. I think she's an incredible leader. And I, I, I to me, um, uh, that was my biggest takeaway, uh, incredible poise, uh, warm, and uh, and I was in, I was just impressed by her dexterity of the subjects that she was talking about throughout the entire course of our our, our journey together. Frankly, because we went to from Air Force from Andrew Air Force Base to, to New Mexico, uh, and we traveled with her throughout uh, New Mexico, seeing her speak at a university, going to a couple of different locations. Um, so it was just uh, pretty impressive to see uh, her in action. So you recently decided to expand Hispanic Executive even a little more with a podcast that's yeah. called the Latino majority. That's correct. Can you tell me about the, 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 the reason for the word majority? Why was it important for that word to, to be in there? And tell us a little bit, a little bit about the goal of the podcast. Uh, yeah. So the goal of the podcast really at the end of the day is to continue to add to the positive narratives of what leadership looks like, what Latino leadership looks like in the country. There just isn't enough stories about successful Latinos that are out there. So for me, you know, um, that, that I had a conversation once with Fidel Vargas, who hopefully we're going to have on the podcast, who's the head of the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. And, and he told me when I asked him what the greatest challenge he felt, and I thought, I asked him, what was, what is the greatest challenge you think the Latino community has today? And I thought he was going to talk about education or you know, something along the lines of the HSF. And what he told me was the story that we tell ourselves about who we are. And that to me resonated. Um, and so uh, that was the impetus behind the podcast. I wanted to create a show that I wanted to listen to. I wanted to be able to talk to personally these incredible Latinos that we've been you know, fortunate to feature in our magazine. And I wanted to create uh, just another platform out there that is uh, educating certainly non-Latinos about who we are, but Latinos themselves, right? About what's possible, about, about people that are out there trailblazing and doing incredible things that are also Latino. And so that was the, the premise behind the podcast. And why majority? Well, you know, we're going to be the majority at some point in time. And so why not plant, plant the flag there? That's always been my thought. It's like, I'm planting the flag where we're going. And I want to, by doing so, hopefully elevate um, the awareness around that reality, right? And, and doing it through the voices of the people that we're interviewing. And so that was really the, the thinking behind that. And one thing I want to ask you, because even though we're, we're talking about your career through the lens of Hispanic executives, specifically, you're the CEO and co-founder of a much, much larger operation called Correct. Guerrero. Yeah. And I was looking at the description and it says it's a quote, exec executive adva advancement company at the intersection of media, professional networks, and executive search. Can you tell me about the, one, that's a cool collection of words, but tell me about the, the, the executive search part. How does that part of the business work? Yeah. So it was a cool collection of words because I have editors on staff that can write things better than I can. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, if you look at what we've done, the, the wake of our work, uh, if, if since founding the company in 2006. So with Hispanic Executive, we've obviously connected with thousands of Latinos working in the private sector. But through our other brands, we've also connected with thousands of uh, diverse leaders, be it African-American, female leaders, uh, LGBT leaders, et cetera. Um, and, you know, in 2020, when we we're uh, in quarantine, I remember hearing uh, a lot of you know, chatter out there from titans of, of industry saying they couldn't find qualified, you name it. Uh, and 
I, I just couldn't believe that people still in 2020 were saying they couldn't find qualified Latino talent. You know, I started my business in 2006 and I have never um, not been able to find Latinos out there leading, doing incredible things. And how can a CEO of a blue chip company who is being uh, served by these incredible big headhunting firms not be able to find qualified Latino talent? We've been doing it since 2006. And so for me, that was really the, the spark that... Um, that lit the fire that said, you know, there's clearly a need and there's a supply behind us. So why not um, try to figure out a way to help our uh, clients and our corporate partners find incredible talent that we've been fortunate to interview uh, across Hispanic executive and our other magazines, but also uh, work with some of those ex executives themselves who have, you know, over time reached out to me and, and, and people on my team about opportunities or what have you. So developing a search service within our ecosystem of executives was was kind of a natural transition and extension of the work that we were that we've been doing very cool all right well to, to wrap pedro we yeah. ask every guest lecturer which is how we refer to our guests a business 101 question so these are rapid fire questions so answer them as quickly as you can but okay. i'll start with the first one what is your earliest money memory My earliest, uh, my earliest money memory was a, a check I would get from my grandfather every birthday uh, from, you know, he lived in the East Coast and I would get a check every birthday for 200 bucks. And I thought it was, I was so excited and I loved getting that. So that's my early money memory is the gift that I would get from my grandfather who I, I saw, you know, once a year. That's a good grandfather. Um, if you had a business school course, what would it be called? So we'll call it Pedro 101, colon, fill in the blank for us. Yeah, uh, business course would, would be the art of business. And it would be forcing uh, or, or creating environments for, for business leaders to, to you know, truly think outside the box, putting them in an art-related course and, and, and preparing them to, to take a stab at being creative so that they can take away from that. Uh, lessons that they could then turn and apply to their own organization. I love it. Sign me up for that one. What's the best business advice you've ever received? Uh, I, I mentioned it earlier. Best business advice uh, is twofold. One, cash is king and uh, the bank doesn't like surprises. So uh, staying on top of uh, cash and watching that on a weekly basis and having regular communication with your bank is absolutely critical. All right. And you're probably the best person I think no exaggeration in this country to ask this last question. For okay. Too. No who pressure. Else, who else should we have as a guest lecturer or a sure. guest on business school? Oh, man. <laughs> what kind of person do you want? You want a, 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 a corporate leader? You want an entrepreneur? I want an entrepreneur. Talk to my friend Mario Carrasco. I think now. Oh, you he interviewed you, right? For um, yeah, his podcast. Yeah. He's a great, he's a great entrepreneur. Uh, and if you're looking to talk to other entrepreneurs, I would say he's a, he's a great one to talk to. Pedro Guerrero, thank you so much for stopping by business school. Uh, thank you for having me.